Hello everyone and welcome to the third and final webinar in our home working series. Uh, my name is Sean Keel, I'm one of the partners in the employment team at Travis Smith and with me today is Adam Rice, one of our Knowledge Council. Um, we've brought you this home working webinar series because um, despite Boris's push to get everyone back to work from August, it does seem likely that home working will continue in some shape or form for the foreseeable future for most businesses. We've certainly seen a rise in requests from employees to work from home on a longer term basis. And so now is a good time to get your ducks in a row on this. Our first webinar in this series looked at your health and safety obligations as an employer. And our second webinar then drilled down into issues around equipment and expenses for home workers. Those recordings are still available on our website. And if you hadn't, have, haven't had a chance to watch them yet, then do please go back and um, look up the Travis Smith website and have a look. So moving on to today, today we wanted to pick up on some of the wider employment considerations for employees working from home. And the first thing I wanted to touch on is documentation. Of course, many if not all of us were thrust into home working with little time to prepare. So what documentation should employers be thinking about now? Adam, should employers have a home working policy? Thanks, Sean, and hi, everyone. Um, well, I guess the starting point here is that there's no obligation to have a home working policy, but there are lots of good reasons why we think it's a good idea to have a home working policy. Um, and even if you've already got a, an existing home working policy, it's not a bad idea, I think, to dust it off and just see how it stands up in the current climate. What we've found when we've looked at um, existing home working policies is that well, not surprisingly, not many of them envisage a situation like COVID, where people are being required to work from home on an extended basis. Lots of existing policies envisage people working from home on an ad hoc basis, or people working from home where the employee has made the request to work from home. So it's worth covering off situations like a global pandemic, uh, perhaps things like terrorism, where employees might be asked or required to work from home. And it's also really useful to have a policy to set out what the expectations are of people working from home. So is there going to be flexibility around things like hours? Or do you expect that people are available during certain core hours? And do you want to have some sort of basic requirements around what home working should look like? For example, um, the employee needs to have access to a room which is not being used by anybody else. All of those sorts of issues less relevant given how everyone's been working um, during COVID. But there's, of course, less scope for supervision when somebody's working remotely and uh, performance management is a little bit trickier. So it is worth thinking about what expectations you might set, um, worth being very clear about those, and, and I think a policy really helps with that. And as we saw in the last webinar, if you've managed to have a look at that, um, it's a good idea to cover off equipment and expenses in a home working policy. So not just what you're going to provide as an employer or what you're going to reimburse, um, but how much personal use is allowed of equipment that you've provided um, or of um, expenses that you've reimbursed, because that, as we've seen, can affect the tax treatment. So worth picking that up in your policy as well. And there are lots of other things that might be useful to cover off, uh, so things like confidentiality and data protection, and we'll come on to some, some more of those things later on. Thanks, Adam. Yes, I think, uh, uh, I certainly think a good a policy is a really good idea, and we are reviewing policies for lots of clients and putting in place new ones for those who don't have one already. Um, one of the key questions here is, are we actually talking about a home working policy or are we talking about a working from anywhere policy? For example, are you happy for your employees to go and work from a location abroad? Uh, and it's worth bearing in mind that there are a number of tax and regulatory implications of working abroad, which would need to be thought through, as well as, of course, any immigration requirements. So it is worth when you look at your home working policy to think what parameters you might want to set. So for working abroad, you might require employees to get the consent of their line manager or HR if they want to work anywhere other than at home. OK, so that's the home working policy. What about employment contracts then? Is there anything to think about there? 
Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, because like you said, Sean, lots of us were thrust into homeworking without uh, any time to prepare um, and no time really to get employees to formally agree to arrangements. Um, but depending on your contract and whether the homework arrangement is a temporary thing or it's a longer term thing, this might constitute a change to terms and conditions. And that's something you would normally need to get the employee's agreement about. Now, I think lots of employers are relying on implied consent in, in the current circumstances, which makes sense, um, again, because there wasn't really time to go around and get um, express agreement to homeworking. Um, but going forward, it might be worth being clear about any formal arrangements that are going to be in place on a longer term basis and also thinking about whether you want to get express agreement from employees. Now, of course, if it's the employee making the request and you're agreeing to that, then you're going to have ex express agreement in most um, situations. But I'm thinking more here about a situation where you're asking people to work from home, particularly on a longer term basis. And there's a bit of a debate to be had because lots of clients are actually cautious about asking for express ex uh, consent at the moment, um, because that can add an extra layer of complexity where you have got proposals to make redundancies, for example, um, either an impending consultation process or an existing consultation process, or in fact, it might trigger a collective consultation obligation, depending on what else is going on in the business. So it's worth factoring in that to your thinking as well. Um, and of course, place of work or work location is a term of the contract. It's something that you've got to include in the document in writing. And so if that changes, then you should be issuing a statement of variation, which can be done just by way of a, a simple letter. And again, this will come down to whether the change in location is a permanent thing or it's a temporary arrangement. Um, a mobility clause might help here. So lots of contracts that we see um, will say that the employer can require the employee to work at a different location, either on a temporary or permanent basis. And so if you've got something like that, that's obviously going to be uh, helpful if you're asking people to work uh, from home. Um, but it might just be worth looking at your contracts to see what's there already and what, if anything, might need changing going forward. Absolutely, I agree with that. And the other thing to remember is about um, post-termination restrictive covenants. Uh, so some people's covenants will be based on where their office is. And if lots of people are working remotely, you might find that your covenants don't work in the way that you expect or may need to be redrafted to be enforceable. So again, worth checking on that point. OK, uh, moving on to a different topic, which is pay. Adam, has any of this led to questions around remuneration? Yeah, interestingly, this has come up for a few clients um, because obviously you've got people who are now working effectively permanently a long way away from their normal work location. And of course their pay or their remuneration was set based on where they were working originally. Now, of course, potentially changing someone's pay um, is a delicate and sometimes complicated issue to address. And obviously you can't change someone's pay without their consent. Unless, of course, you're in a situation where you've got um, a particular waiting for location and if the employee is no longer working in that location and it's clear that the waiting applies to only to that location then you probably would be justified in taking that away but um, remuneration is certainly something that lots of our clients are, are thinking about um, when these sorts of arrangements change. It's amazing how many different issues actually arise in this context because one of the other things that we've been thinking about in the employment contract is the duty of confidentiality, which can present a particular challenge when um, thinking about home working. So you might have staff who are on confidential calls with flatmates, family members, or even neighbours within air earshot. Adam, how can employers manage this? Yeah, I think uh, confidentiality, um, information security and data protection are all really important things to think about when you've got people working from home for exactly the reasons that you've just um, mentioned. And I think broadly there are two things to think about here. Um, the first thing is equipment. 
So one of the big advantages of you providing equipment as the employer, uh, particularly IT equipment, is um, you can be uh, more sure of things like confidentiality and security. So if you provide a laptop, you can be sure it's compatible with your systems, that it's got the right sort of virus protection software, and uh, hopefully can easily be um, uh, erased remotely if necessary. And there are lots of other sort of more simple pieces of kit that you can provide, and lots of our clients are providing things like uh, headsets, um, just an added layer of confidentiality on phone calls, um, things like privacy screens, which, which can all help. So equipment, I think, is one piece of the puzzle. The other piece um, here is around uh, training and communication. So this is always important with things like confidentiality and data protection, but it's particularly important with home workers. Uh, I think most of your staff, hopefully, are not going to be deliberately trying to breach confidentiality or pass on uh, sensitive personal data. But it's the inadvertent slips, I think, that you need to really uh, worry about with home workers. So the best thing you can do is remind staff of their obligations around confidentiality, uh, data protection, information security, and remind them not to have calls within earshot of other people or to leave confidential documents lying around or, or indeed th throw confidential documents into the the recycling bin, they need to be shredded or brought back into the office to be shredded. Um, so some sort of refresh or even bespoke training for home workers, I think would be helpful in, in this area. Yes, that's very interesting. And, uh, and the next point that we're going to come on to, which I think we've all started to have discussions with our clients about, is around the topic of insurance. Uh, what, Adam, do employers need to think about on this topic? Yeah, I think lots of people are starting to think about insurance now. Um, it, it, it's just worth checking your employer's liability insurance policy um, to check that it covers people when they're working from home. We would normally expect that it would, um, but it, it does merit checking. And also just checking whether there are any sort of notification obligations. You might have an obligation to notify your insurers, for example, particularly if you've got a large number of your employees working from home. For employees, um, well, you might want to remind them about um, checking their own home insurance um, and also things like the terms of their mortgage or their lease. So just again, to see there's no issues around home working. Um, and whether there are any sort of notification obligations that they might be under under their policy. That's really a point for the employee to check for themselves, but it's something you could remind them to do, for example, in your home working policy or in a wider communication. OK, so turning to something different, um, we thought it might be useful to, to think about flexible work, working requests because we and I know a lot of our clients are seeing many requests from employees to work from home on a longer term basis as lots of people have found that it's worked well for them over the last few months. Adam, how should employers be managing these requests? Yeah, we are certainly seeing a rise in flexible working requests at the moment. And of course, um, there's a statutory process for dealing with flexible working requests. Um, employees who've got six months service can now make a request for flexible working um, and they don't need any particular reason to make the request. Um, they just need to have the six months service. There used to be um, quite a strict process for dealing with flexible working requests under the statutory process. Um, so there were some set timeframes for holding meetings and responding to the request. There's a lot more flexibility now. So the overarching obligation is just to consider a flexible working request reasonably and to respond within a reasonable time frame. And now there's a long stop date of, of three months. So you have to respond within three months um, of receiving the request. But ideally, you would be responding sooner than that. But I guess the process will be largely dictated by what your end goal is as an organization. So some organizations are taking uh, the current circumstances as an opportunity to get more people working from home on a more regular basis or on a more permanent basis. 
Um, so if you're inclined to agree to flexible working requests, then uh, the process will be less relevant. You can probably afford to adopt a, a more formal, a, a less formal process um, in agreeing to requests. It, it's on the other side of the coin where you're looking to turn down a request, where you'd be more concerned about uh, following a more formal process. And if you, you are wanting to say no to flexible working, then I think you're gonna to need to think very carefully about what critical reasons you can give to turn down a request, particularly in the current climate where lots of people have been working home, from home fairly effectively during the COVID pandemic. Um, and remember there are a limited number of reasons for turning down requests under the legislation. And so they are limited to things like additional costs to the business, um, or uh, an impact on quality or performance, which might be relevant if you're saying that things like teamwork and collaboration are going to be impaired if lots of people are working from home longer term. But there are lots yeah. to think about there on flexible working requests. Yes, you're absolutely right, Adam. And um, I think that that question of how to turn down a request using the limited number of statutory reasons is going to come up, come up again and again for employers. OK, so we thought we'd move on to a, a different topic to close, um, which is mental health and well-being. Um, we've left this until the end, but it is one of the most critical issues to consider with employees working from home, both from a legal perspective in terms of your duty to care to staff, um, but also from a staff morale point of view. Adam, have you got any particular tips you can give us here? Yeah, it is a good question. It's, it's clearly a big issue, um, particularly in the current climate. There was a, a recent survey by ACAS, which found that almost 40% of those working from home uh, during the pandemic felt stressed, anxious, or experienced some other mental health difficulties. And I think there are two particular risks to manage here. The first is people feeling like they're lacking supervision and support uh, where they're working by themselves at home. Um, and secondly, people feeling isolated simply because they're missing the social interaction of the workplace. Um, and there's no magic silver bullet or one size fits all approach, but I think communication, again, is really critical here. So um, ensuring managers uh, and colleagues keep in touch um, with their, their colleagues and, and um, reports as much as possible um, is going to be important. And, and that's not only just to, to check in to see how they're going with their work, but also to check in sort of more generally um, to see how they're getting on and uh, to spot any sort of warning signs of potential um, mental health uh, issues. And I think it's it's important to have st structured catch ups in this regard because um, there's a real uh, risk that things otherwise might slip through the cracks. Um, one way of doing that, um, it's not the only way, but one way that's suggested by MIND, the mental health charity, is to have what's called a, a wellness action plan. It's a bit like an appraisal where the employee is asked to fill out uh, a survey um, with a list of questions, things like what helps support your mental health and well-being and what um, hinders it or what triggers are there for things like stress. If the employee completes that, then sits down and has a structured conversation with their line manager, it comes up with a bit of a, a plan for any action points that might be necessary. Um, and as I said, it's not the only way to do it, but, but having some sort of structure around that process or those catch-ups, I think is helpful. But on the flip side, I think it's important also to have um, less structured catch-ups as well. So just regular check-ins, um, sort of virtual coffee breaks, um, Zoom quizzes, if, if we're, we don't all have too much Zoom fatigue at the moment, um, keeping the social side going for people who are work, working remotely and where you've got part of the workforce working remotely and part in the workplace, um, thinking about how you can include everybody um, in those social engagements. Um, and of course, the other big thing here is ensuring people take their breaks and take holiday. Now, I guess lots of people are very cautious about traveling at the moment, particularly with um, the rules around quarantine, which can change overnight, as we've seen. Um, but it's worth reminding people that they, they should be taking holiday and it's important to have that sort of rest and relaxation. 
Yes, I think the holiday point is an absolutely critical one. I, I know I've spoken to lots of clients about how difficult it is for, for them as individuals uh, to take holiday and uh, similarly for their workforces. So I think I think that's an ongoing battle for most businesses at the moment. Well, on that note, I think that covers everything we were planning to say today. Obviously, there's a lot to think about in all of this. Um, we are working with a range of clients on their home working arrangements at the moment. So if you do have any questions at all, don't hesitate to get in touch. Our contact details are on the slide. Or, of course, feel free to get in touch with your usual employment department contact. That just leaves me to say thanks very much for joining our webinar series. I hope you found them useful. Do let us have any feedback for future sessions. And in the meantime, do take care. Goodbye.